this levee would break. We would have a flood that would wash away from Memphis to New Orleans. A looming natural disaster. It rained and rained and rained some more. A wall of water unleashed. You see them screaming, blood curdling yells. The year is 1927. It's a war scene. There are refugees everywhere. Stories of bravery and tragedy. She said, oh God, my baby's coming. A deadly force of nature and the human storm that changed the nation forever. Fatal Flood, tonight on American Experience. American Experience is made possible by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance public understanding of the role of technology. The foundation also seeks to portray the lives of the men and women engaged in scientific and technological pursuit. At the Scotts Company, we help make gardens more beautiful, lawns greener, trees taller. If there's a better business to be in, please let us know. Funding for this program brought to you by American Experience is also made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Well, the winter of 27 it started raining early in the year that year. January, February, rain seemed like every day. It rained and rained and rained and rained some more. It just looked like it would never stop. The river kept coming above flood level. And it was rumored in all of the papers and things that if this levee would break, we would have a flood that would wash away from Memphis to New Orleans. On April 15th, 1927, Good Friday, as another violent storm battered Greenville, Mississippi, a party was held in one of the town's finest homes. As the rain intensified, Guests were drawn to the windows. Just beyond their view, the Mississippi River was rising to unprecedented heights. A burst of thunder shook the house and the party fell silent. All eyes turned to one man, Leroy Percy. The former senator was one of the most powerful planters in the Mississippi Delta. Senator Percy, one woman asked, Will the levees hold? Percy gathered a group of men and rushed to the levee protecting Greenville from the river. The levee was holding, but barely. Staring at the angry water, Percy could see that an epic battle was looming, pitting man against nature. What he couldn't see was that a human storm was also approaching one that would pit money against honor, black man against white, even father against son. Delta, fear God and the Mississippi, a saying goes. 
the river punishes with great destruction and rewards with great wealth. Its floodwaters leave behind some of the most lush and fertile soil on earth. For half a century after the Civil War, Delta planters had been richly rewarded by the river. By the early 1900s, they presided over one of the most productive cotton-growing regions in the world. In an age when cotton was king, self-styled planter aristocrats ruled their domains like feudal lords. The most ambitious of them all was Leroy Percy. His empire extended far beyond the cotton fields to the boardrooms of railroads and banks. As a prominent lawyer and businessman, he was determined to bring the plantation economy into the 20th century. Leroy Percy saw the Delta, I think, as this great, bursting, industrial region. But the industry in the Delta was agriculture. That did not mean that it would be any less efficient than a northern factory. It would operate with every bit as much efficiency. And of course, the labor was the key to that. It was mighty easy to to make a living with cotton. And you had the benefit of, of human labor there that was about as inexpensive as you could get. And these big plantations, they'd have thousands of blacks that worked there. I mean, you, you couldn't raise it without the blacks. But without human labor there, he couldn't exist. Not only, not only important, it was vital. The plantation system offered African Americans work, but very little else. Most families scraped out a living from sharecropping. The planters provided a small plot of land. Everything else was advanced on credit and deducted from the workers' share of the crop. It was a system ripe for abuse. It was known on some plantations that the only thing that the people gathered in life was what you would call three M's, meat, meal, and molasses. And they would work from sun up until sundown. And when the season was over, the only thing they had left was an indebtedment of four or five hundred dollars, something they couldn't afford because the white owners say during the time that they worked for the seed that season, they had used up all the meat meal and molasses, but they had nothing. And when I say nothing, I mean nothing. The planters looked at black people as workers. They looked at black people as people who should be willing and eager to work for them to produce their cotton. And when they weren't eager, they could be coerced. Well, I won't call his name, but there was a plantation owner that carried a bull whoop all the time. And he spoke with that whoop. And uh, I've seen him beat the blacks on Washington Avenue because they didn't get out of his way. Like his fellow planters, Leroy Percy feared losing his black labor force. But unlike many, he believed the best way to keep African Americans in the Delta was to treat them fairly. Decency, Percy insisted, was part of the Southern Code of Honor. The Percys had a sense of noblesse oblige. They thought of themselves as having more empathy with people of African descent. They saw themselves as being more understanding, more tolerant of them, more friendly with them. They saw themselves as being noblesse oblige incarnate. They were real business people, the persons were real business people. They knew that their livelihood came from the blacks. So why destroy what makes your money? That's how I looked at them. So it was all business. In 1910, Leroy Percy took his views on race relations and business to Washington when he was appointed to a vacant Senate seat. 
A year later, Percy ran for re-election against a bitter political enemy. Former Mississippi Governor James K. Vardaman was a populist and an unapologetic racist. If it is necessary, he warned, every Negro in the state will be lynched to maintain white supremacy. Vardaman defeated Percy in a landslide. The effect of the defeat of 1911 on Leroy Percy was to send him into the deepest gloom he'd probably ever experienced. He felt that he had let down the side, so to speak, that his honor had been violated because not only had he lost the election, but he'd come in third, a sitting senator coming in third. Retreating to Washington County, Leroy resumed his work and consoled himself for the diversions of a country gentleman. Leroy was a classic man's man. Hunted, fished, played poker, and he knew how to operate. Uh, he was not naive about anything. And as his son said, no one ever made the mistake of thinking he wasn't dangerous. Leroy's commanding personality was altogether different from that of his only son and heir, William Alexander Percy. Soft-spoken and introspective, Will was ill-suited to the stringent code of Southern manhood. He felt himself an outsider almost from the start. He worshipped his father. He thought he was the grandest man and the most heroic that one could possibly have. At the same time, he thought, I'll never be like him, and I should. It's my duty as a Percy to be as much like my father as possible. But he couldn't. It wasn't in his nature. He was smaller physically. He saw no pleasure whatsoever in hunting or fishing. Would never go on these trips. Even as a young boy, he wouldn't go with his father. He was a poet. Uh, and. He was, uh, he was gay. Will had tried to live up to his father's expectations. He went to Harvard, earned a law degree, served with valor in World War I, and joined his father's law practice in Greenville. But in his own mind, he never measured up. It was hard having such a dazzling father, Will recalled. No wonder I longed to be a hermit. Will often walked alone on the levee, his thoughts turning to poetry. What I wrote, he explained, seemed more essentially myself than anything I did or said. Will Percy wrote a piece called Falling Leaves, and he wrote about how he was walking along the river bank. And he says, I know it is fall because I am loneliest now. I go home to my family and I see my mother pacing up and down, and my father saying, hush, don't say those things. It's a very moving piece of writing, but uh, it indicates how he recognized his parents' dissatisfaction with him and his inability to do anything about it, and even to speak of it was impossible. Despite his feelings, Will continued to live in his father's house on Percy Street, placing the family empire above his own happiness. In the spring of 1922, that empire would come under direct attack. The Ku Klux Klan was gaining ground throughout the country. Klan supporters dominated the state governments of Colorado and Indiana, they helped elect the governors of a dozen states. By the 1920s, the Klan had swept over the Mississippi Hill Country and several counties in the Delta. They now challenged Leroy Percy in his own domain. Percy despised the Klan. They attacked those closest to him. His wife was a Catholic, his business partner a Jew. 
his empire was dependent on black labor. When he learned of a planned Klan rally in Greenville, Leroy decided to fight back. On March 1, 1922, a tense crowd packed the Greenville courthouse. The Klansman spoke first. The Klansman starts out with his usual spiel. He's against the Catholics, he's, the, the Pope's got this plot here, the Jews are doing that, the blacks are a threat to Southern womanhood. It was a rousing speech. It had never been opposed. Will watched his father step up to the podium. No one knew what to expect. He starts out with humor. Uh, he goes on to say that he's got a partner who's a Jew, and he agrees that the Jews need to be held in line because he points out that his Jewish partner had loaned $150,000 to people who lived in Washington County at below market interest rates. And Percy had a real problem with that. Uh, so all of a sudden he's got the audience laughing and he starts mocking the Klan. And in the end, however, he gets serious. I know the terror the Klan embodies for our Negro population, Percy declared. And I am here to plead against it. We have feasted together at the weddings of our young people. We have stood together around the graves of our loved ones. We have stood together and undivided. And he asked even the Klansmen, he said, we want you to come home, come back to this community, leave the Klan. Uh, it, it was just a tremendous speech. At the close of Father's speech, Will wrote, the crowd went wild shouting and cheering. That evening, they passed a resolution condemning the Klan. This didn't happen anywhere else in the South, that the leadership of a rural uh, community would stand up and uh, confront and defeat uh, the Ku Klux Klan at that period is unprecedented. Our town was saved, Will wrote. Righteousness had prevailed. Leroy's victory had brought the Percys closer together, uniting them with a sense of honor and purpose. But the Mississippi River would soon threaten Greenville and test the bond between father and son. In the autumn of 1926, Violent storms pelted the northern United States, engorging streams and rivers. The arteries drained south, funneling the waters of a continent into the Mississippi. By March 1927, huge swells reached the top of the delta. Greenville was only a hundred miles downriver. Just imagine a force that's more than a mile wide maybe 100 feet deep, and it's moving at nine miles an hour. Think of what's behind that. Clearly, it's something to be feared. I mean, it's the greatest geological force in the United States. It was a force the Army Corps of Engineers thought it could control. The Corps had built levees, some four stories high, on both banks of the river, running the 1,100-mile span from Carroll, Illinois, to New Orleans. If you looked at these levees at low water, they looked like great impregnable fortresses. In 1926, for the first time in the official report of the Army engineers, they say that they are now in a position to prevent the damaging impact of floods on the lower Mississippi Valley classic hubris. April brought record downpours. By the middle of the month, the first government-built levee crumbled in Dorina, Missouri. The surge of water pushed south, bursting more levees, flooding more than a million acres of land and leaving 50,000 people homeless. The Delta was next. 
So here comes this crest down the river at such a volume that some rivers are actually backing up because the Mississippi is so full of water that, for example, the Arkansas River, it starts flowing backward because the Mississippi is so high, it pushes it back. So that's the kind of water we're talking about, this enormous amount of water coming down the river. When that river gets to the top of the levee and is lapping over, it is guarded. Arkansas people guard the levee against Mississippi people. Mississippi people guard the levee against the Arkansas people. Afraid somebody will blow the levee and turn the water loose on the other side. If I blow your side of the levee, you're going to get washed off the face of the earth, and I'm going to stay dry. Because the water didn't come my way. It went your way. The wall of water kept pushing south. Levees began to collapse along the Arkansas River. It was already the worst flood on record, and it was aiming all its force at Greenville. In desperation, Percy and his fellow planters pulled their workers from the fields to do battle with the river. They became part of an army of 30,000 men, including convicts who struggled to raise the height of the levees with rows of sandbags. Still, the river continued to rise. When even more men were needed on the levees, Greenville's police resorted to force. They started going through Greenville and taking all of the black men. This is another thing that I can remember so plainly. All of the black people even kids out of school to go and protect the levee. And almost man for man, a boy for boy, the whites had guns on, and the others had nothing but picks and shovels. They had shotguns, they just hurried them up and drove them to the levee. Right down Nelson Street, that was the Negro drag at the time, and they just got them off the streets and just carried them right down to the levee and start them to work. White residents began to panic. Those who could afford it boarded trains leaving the region. Upriver from Greenville, at a great bend in the river, the Mounds Landing levee was showing signs of trouble. On Good Friday, the Delta was battered by the most savage storm of them all. As much as 15 inches of rain fell in 18 hours. One resident recorded in his diary, heaven spare us. The Mounds Landing levee was beginning to crumble. It's cold, damp, rainy. The break is increasing. The water is washing over top of the levee. And according to some accounts, the, the levee starts feeling loose. The water started rising an inch an hour. That's fast. That's two feet a day. There is a limit to how high you can build sandbags. They didn't think it was going to hold. In fact, it was getting worse by the minute. They were throwing all the sandbags in there they could, and just, but just kept getting bigger and bigger, and they, they couldn't stop it men working on the sandbags know full well there's no way that this thing is going to hold. And they start to abandon the position. And the National Guard officer orders rifles held on them and threatens to shoot them if they leave. And these fellows were filling their sacks with sand. And my stepfather, he noticed that at the bottom of the levee, some water started coming out. And he grabbed my hand, grabbed my arm, I guess, and he said, uh, run, Johnny boy, run for your life. And the levee starts shaking and rumbling, and men start running, and all of a sudden, a big section of the levee, several hundred feet wide, just sort of pushes out and carries men with it. 
You see him screaming, yelling, blood curdling, yelling. And uh, they were gone. So you've let the Mississippi out. And uh, you could almost hear it yelling. It's free. I'm free again. <laughs> and man, it came out with a roar. Oof. My stepfather said to me, he said, God damn. He said, remember, Johnny boy, you'll have a lot of close calls in your life. You're not going to have any closer one than this one tonight. The break at Mounds Landing released more than double the volume of Niagara Falls. It flooded an area 50 miles wide and 100 miles long. It put water over the tops of houses in Yazoo City, 75 miles away. The deluge was cascading south through the cotton fields of Washington County. It was only a matter of hours before the water reached Greenville, inundating the city from the rear. Leroy Percy now faced total disaster. The river was seizing his empire. Up in his room, Leroy's son was writing poetry. Will had been working feverishly through the night. I was in a writer's tantrum, he would later confess. The water rolled toward Greenville, wiping out forests and farms. It was a sight to see, there's no doubt about it. It's hard to describe, it just... It just had a force to it, it was just... Oh my lord, it's coming from air which it works. I was so scared, I didn't know what had happened. I'll tell you the truth, I didn't know. I'm late that evening, and you couldn't see nothing but water. You hear people hollering, you know, scared and running there with your way, you know. And people getting their boats and things go searching for them, you know. When it got light enough for us to see, you could see horses and cows and dogs and everything else right in that water drowning. I thought it was all going to drown. The flood finally reached Greenville in the early morning hours of Friday, April 22nd. I looked at it and said, oh, I see it coming. It's coming. And it was creeping into the gutters, but it was coming fast. Not heavy waves, just seeping in. But I tell you, sleeping in a hurry. Ten feet of water inundated downtown. The current at the intersection of Broadway and Main turned deadly. You could just see the livestock floating dead in the, in the waters. And you know, young children at that time knew everybody's horse and everybody's cow. You said, there goes Mr. Fowler's cow, there goes Mr. Williams. Horse, you know, just bloated and floating. Some residents found safety in the upper floors of stores and churches. Others clung to rooftops. Anyone with a boat was pressed into service. I had a sea sled at that time with about a 25 or 30 horsepower motor, and I uh, became a rescue captain. This was a great event for me at that time, 14. And so every day we had assigned certain routes, and we'd go out, pick these people up, bring them back to the high ground, and keep going on my route. What I saw these three people, two kids, and what I thought was a very fat black woman, on top of a cotton house. And uh, as she got in, she said, Oh God, my baby's coming. I said, What'd you say, ma'am? He said, Oh God, my baby's coming. Well, I said, Can you just wait, hold it 40 minutes 
said, oh, we, I get to get it to the high ground and they look after you. She said, no, so I said, he's coming now. And I thought, what in the world <laughs> do I do? And she said, don't worry, I said, just be real gentle with him. I said, just take his head and pull him slowly. And said, he'll come on out. I'll push. And she pushed and I pulled. And here it was a little baby boy. I then dipped him in the Mississippi River, the flood water, and uh, hit him a couple of times. And he started crying. And she says, give him to me. I'll take him on my breast. And she lay down. She was still in the dirty water. And she took his baby, put him on her breast. Well, I think I cried. That's all I remember. Uh, my first experience of being a midwife. Anyway, I untied the boat. And when we got close to the high ground, I hollered at him and I said, look, I've got a new baby, just born. I got the mother up, and as she stepped out of the boat, she turned to me and said, what's your name? So I said, John. She said, I'm gonna name this baby John. That's the last I saw of her. Amazing woman. Listen, that amazing woman. <laughs> For 36 hours, the Delta was in turmoil, in movement, in terror, Will wrote. Then the water covered everything and a great quiet settled down. Father looked somberly over the drowning town, Will noted. He was tired. But there was work to do. Leroy immediately began raising money for his devastated community and appointed his son head of the Flood Relief Committee. The task before Will was enormous. Up until now, Will was known only for being his father's son. Now, at age 42, he would have the chance to prove himself worthy of the Percy name. deluge had covered 27,000 square miles, an area the size of four New England states. The flood, one preacher said, had spread as wide as God's arms. More than a thousand people were dead. Washington County was hardest hit. The water washed away 2,200 buildings, damaged or destroyed thousands more. It displaced tens of thousands of people. We lose a few clothes and furniture, so we lose everything we had. What little we had, you know, didn't nobody had too much, but you know, whatever, it'd mean a whole lot to you because you didn't have nothing else. As the rescue efforts expanded, rowboats and skiffs followed power lines to farms and houses. Many whites were evacuated from the region. Blacks were rounded up from the countryside and deposited on Greenville's levee, a narrow island of high ground with the river on one side and flooded land on the other. Two days after the mound's landing break, more than 10,000 refugees crammed the eight-foot-wide crown of the levee in a line that stretched over five miles. There were no tents to start with. There was just a few blankets. 
and you can see them stretching blankets across a little frame to try to make a tent-like place to stay out of the weather, which was really bad. It was April, it was rainy, it was cold. These people had been out in rescue boats. It was miserable. The city's water supply was contaminated. Its food supply destroyed. With no sanitation facilities, the refugees were at risk for typhoid and cholera. For Will Percy, there was only one honorable course to take. Evacuate the black refugees to safer havens downriver. Will immediately called a meeting of the town's relief committee. Convinced that he spoke for his father, the committee agreed to Will's call for an evacuation order. When a group of planters learned of the plan, they were furious. Afraid that they would lose their workers, they demanded that Will rescind the order. The planters reasoned that if these people ever got away, they may never come back. They wanted to ensure that they had laborers to try to finish out the cotton crop if the water went down that year. And this was a perfect example of that mentality that Mississippi planters had. It didn't really matter if these people were uncomfortable. It didn't really matter if they were starving. And it probably wouldn't have really mattered a whole lot if a lot of them had died for one reason or another. They were gonna keep their laborers and that's this ruthless contempt for human beings. Will was appalled by the planters' demands and refused to budge. Undaunted, they took their case directly to his father. The next morning, Leroy Percy went searching for his son. Leroy finds Will on the levee. It's a war scene. There are refugees everywhere. They begin to take a walk. Leroy is suggesting gently that perhaps the evacuation was not the best decision to make. Will is saying it's the only decision. Leroy disagrees. Will is stubborn, insists there's no way he could do anything else. While they are talking, 500 white women and children are loaded on one of the barges, and the loading of the blacks has begun. Steamers and barges had come from all over the river. There are enough steamers essentially to evacuate the entire city in a day. The captains are told to stand by. Finally, Leroy gets out of Will one concession, that he will meet with that committee once again to discuss the decision before everyone is loaded. Then, without Will's knowledge, Leroy approached each member of the relief committee. He, too, feared that an exodus of blacks would prove disastrous. His son, he said, had spoken only for himself. When the committee reconvened a few hours later, they dealt Will a stunning blow. To a man, the members now oppose the evacuation. Although he does not admit it, he had to know right then, at that moment, that the only way this committee reversed itself was because his father had betrayed him, had betrayed him personally, had chosen Washington County and the empire he had built over his son. The evacuation is canceled. The steamboats that are standing by leave empty. Every captain absolutely infuriated over the waste of time and resources. For Will, it was a wrenching moment. Ever since he was a young boy, he had tried to live up to his father's ideals of honor and decency. Now, those principles seem to have lost their meaning. The next day, April 26th, an emissary from the federal government was on his way to Greenville. Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover. 
He was in charge of coordinating what had become the largest rescue and relief operation in the nation's history. There were 600,000 refugees in the flood region. Food, supplies, and medical care would come from the Red Cross, which was setting up tent cities on high ground. By the time Hoover arrived in Greenville, he was expecting to see an evacuation underway. But when he met the younger Percy on the levee, Will proposed a completely different plan. Greenville would become a Red Cross distribution hub. The blacks on the levee would provide the labor. Hoover approved the new plan, then left town. For the whites who remained in Greenville, daily life was settling into a dreary routine. A boardwalk was built throughout the downtown area. Some merchants opened up their doors for business. For African Americans, life was very different. The lucky few found shelter in towns. Most others were herded into tent cities patrolled by the National Guard. You was on the levee, you stayed on the levee, unless you got a pass to be able to go into town. You had to have a tag on you. You was tagged. When you got ready to give you a, a shot, you had to get another tag. Your chest was full of tags. You didn't go nowhere unless you got permission to go. You had to have a tag on you. And it was just, it was really slavery. Some guardsmen began to abuse their power. Reports spread of beatings and rapes in the tent cities. Blacks outside the camps were infuriated, but powerless to help. My brother come down there to see about us, but he couldn't come into camp. So I went down in the bushes to see him. And while I was down there, one of them soldiers walked up on me. Get up. Put the pistol on me. And my brother had a pistol too. Now my brother wasn't, in, wasn't a refugee, but my brother put the pistol on him and made him leave me alone. And of course my brother went, hit the road, went on, came on back to Greenville. But it was, it was, it was, it was some awful times. A week into the flood, life in the camp was becoming unbearable. Beyond the lines of tents, thousands of starving livestock shared the narrow stretch of levee. Dead animals were thrown into the foul water. The stench was overwhelming. When the first Red Cross supplies arrived in Greenville, they were not distributed on the basis of need. The whites would take what they wanted or give it to who they want. Naturally, the whites had better means of getting it. First come, first serve with the whites. Blacks, they were at the end of the line. They got whatever was left. Sometimes there was nothing left. The National Red Cross grew concerned about Will's leadership and launched a secret investigation into profiteering and theft in Washington County. Will lost control of the situation. There were ultimately 154 refugee camps run by the Red Cross. Greenville, Mississippi became the single worst refugee camp of 154. Leroy Percy was not there to help his son. He was crisscrossing the country trying to rebuild the Delta's finances. 
To falter or fail now, he warned, would mean the abandonment of an empire. In June, two months after the mound's landing break, the flood finally started to recede. Some residents began returning to their homes. More and more boatloads of Red Cross supplies were now arriving on the levee. Will desperately needed laborers to unload the cargo. Once again, city blacks were pressed into work gangs. They forced them into the service, and I think they could have gotten enough without it. But that was the only way they knew, and that was the quick way to do it, by force. I became a dictator, Will recalled. But the consciousness that my judgments were often wrong was a continuing nightmare. There was just all this internal hostility. He could not take this frustration out on his father. Will had been humiliated, and in his humiliation, he began to humiliate uh, the black men and women and children on the levee. And there was no place else for this frustration to go. An influential black newspaper proclaimed that Will Percy's prejudice against blacks is as bitter as gall. Two and a half months into the flood, racial tensions came to a boil. There was one black gentleman who had actually just gotten off the levee after working all night. He had gone back to his house to sleep. The police were going through the black neighborhoods looking for men to bring back to the levee. A police officer went up to this gentleman on his porch and told him to get in the truck. He told him, you go to work, and the answer was, no, I've been to work. So he says, you're supposed to work, go when I tell you. And the man got up to go in the house, and he shot him down on his front porch. And I don't think it was a black person with dry eyes in that town. All of a sudden, the whole city is electrified, incredibly tense over all of this. Uh, there is real fear in the white community that, who are vastly outnumbered that there is going to be a race war. Will Percy marched into the center of the storm. He called a meeting of the black community at a local church. When he arrived, the church was empty. One at a time, the black leaders began to enter. Amid an uneasy silence, Will rose to the pulpit. The quiet poet suddenly transformed himself into an angry preacher. You sit before me, sour and full of hatred, Will declared. You think I am the murderer? I am not the murderer. That foolish young policeman is not the murderer. The murderer is you. Your hands are dripping with blood. It was the most amazing speech that he could have made to the African-American community. After all they had endured, after all the work they had done, he told them that the city of Greenville had saved them. The city of Greenville had fed them. And how did they pay white folks back? They paid them back by being lazy, being indolent and refusing to work. He demanded that they all get on their knees and pray to God to forgive them for the murder of that poor black man. And if you're going to keep your heel on the neck of thousands and thousands of people and keep them as downtrodden laborers Ultimately, you can't be nice about it. And that's what Leroy Percy knew when it came down to it. And that's what Will Percy was finding out and going along with. 
the fragile bond between the Percys and Delta Blacks, was broken. Our people have the most troubling road to travel, Leroy wrote to a friend. Some will be able to make it. Many, broken and discouraged, will fail. In a year and a half, Leroy Percy was dead. His dream of empire swept away with the torrent of water. Shortly after his speech at the church, Will Percy resigned as head of the Greenville Relief Committee. The following day, he left the Delta for an extended trip to Japan. He would return to Greenville to rebuild his father's plantation. There, Will would live and die in the house where he was born. He would never write poetry again. For many African Americans, the flood of 1927 marked the end of an era and the start of a journey. As the Mississippi River finally retreated to its banks, they began heading north. When you go north, there were chances of were, you know, getting something. If they had remained there with cotton 50 cents a pound and meat meal and molasses, how long could they have existed? So many people wanted to leave here to go to Chicago. And I believe some of them rode free, so many of them got on the trains. Here in Greenville, you had the train was at ground level. And they were just all around waiting, pushing to get on the train. I sure didn't want to go to Chicago. Everybody was going but me. <laughs> they just knew they were going to the promised land. A great river of humanity was flowing out of the delta. Within a year of the flood, tens of thousands of sharecroppers would turn their backs on the planters of the delta. The exodus Leroy Percy had feared so long could not be stopped. 